see people here on a uh, Friday afternoon, so that's really uh, quite a good thing to see with that, especially when it's so nice and warm and out before we get to that. Uh, well, first off, I'm going to share with you a project that really uh, has only been in, on our campus has only been going on for 16 months. So keep in mind the time scales that this is still a relatively new project. Um, and it's hidden away and I'll explain things about that. But it's only been going on for 16 months, so we're still in our beginning stages. And uh, my work with it, I do have various titles depending on where I'm at, what minute I'm at, but this is a Science and Math uh, Education Institute director, which we're based out of Custer Hall, and we do projects across the state as well as locally, and, and primarily our grant driven this comes up. Well, first off, you're probably saying a makerspace, you've heard, maybe you've heard about them or seen them around. And uh, this is kind of a simple quote that we have here. It was, it was actually, this quote is by Sweet. one of our um, folks that uh, works down there, Earl uh, Watkins, who's down there, is one of our students. And as you can see, it's pretty good. It's a place that takes the imagination and produces reality. And I think that kind of captures the essence of it. It is a STEM area but it's kind of a do-yourself thing. And, and the maker space is part of what's called the maker movement. And I do have, if you're really interested, there's a book out even called Making Makers, Kids, Tools, and the Future of Innovation. Because one of the uh, strengths that I heard, because I've, I've done some work in France with schools there, and I always commented that what they liked about the United States school system is we promoted innovation. And I didn't want to tell them what we had been doing to ourselves with our assessments that promoted knowing back to it. So I did just said, okay, you know, great. But this is a chance to recapture that, just as the new next generation science standards. If you want, that's a whole other talk that I won't go into. But the idea is a place where can we get innovation, the creativeness. And it's not just writing the, the better program, but it's who makes the next best thing are who takes all the things that are out there and puts together some new way. And that's what this is, imagination produce reality that comes up. Now I'm going to, this presentation I'm going to share with you is first to give you a little sense of what we have going on downstairs here in the library in terms of the makerspace, but then also a vision of where we might want to head with this. Because it turns out makerspaces, we were one of the first ones in the state of Kansas, and that's according to Marsha Dvorak. She's at KU, does after school science programs and sponsors programs across the state. And we, they, they were very interested in us because we were the first uh, in the state, particularly the first academic makerspace in Kansas. Of course, we all know Port Hayes is always out there, uh, sometimes on the bleeding edge, is the way I like to put it. So we were there. Um, and, uh, but, we, but, but, but since then, they began to grow. They're showing up in communities, public libraries, academic libraries. They're growing because people are recognizing that this sort of thing is what we need for everybody not just college students, not just elementary kids, adults, it's everybody. So uh, an informational video, uh, just to, we'll jump right into that. Um, don't mind the picture of the guy in the first one, and of course now I gotta find where's the video at. Yeah, maybe I'll just click the It's, it's over on the far left. Far left, oh there, okay. Uh, I'm trouble seeing. So we'll, uh, um, we'll take it full screen. And you know, we got a handsome double there to start. It's the guys <laughs> in the background, but uh, anyway, we'll go on with that. Two makerspace located here in the basement of Forsyth Library is a place for 40 k students in the community to come in and invent and take and tinker and create and try out their ideas using the tools that are here in the makerspace. So makerspace is a place that takes from the imagination and produces reality. The Just wait. Obviously, we have to make good videos. The purpose is to drive science, technology, engineering, and mathematics through fun and education interaction within a do-it-yourself environment. Currently, down in the makerspace, we host projects such as squishy circuits, where you can use Play-Doh to build electrical circuits, high-altitude balloons, where you can learn how you can build a package and fly it up to 100,000 feet and have it come back down, uh, rocketry, whether it's uh, make a stop rocket or if it's to make an actual motorized rocket you have up. We also have the possibility of learning how to use to develop robotic how to build a, how to work with a humanoid robot, 3D printing, 3D scanning, and just using some electrical circuits and learning how to control tools to 
devices you have in the home. They also maintain a lot of products that you can just walk in. And okay, well, you know, it's, it's almost done. So. <laughs> Here we want to learn about Legos or uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars or just come down and ask how to fix your basic cell phone. Come down and check it out at the maker's place. So, uh, that's uh, a quick overview. Do you have any questions about what you saw there before you go back to the uh, power point? No? Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, I, the sewing machine. Yeah, what about the sewing machines? Well, are you making parts for the sewing machine? Well. Well, she looked like she was sewing. <laughs> she, she was. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, let me, let me come back and, and tell you why we have sewing machines. Just a bit. I'm going to answer you. I really will. Uh, I really will. But we do have, I think we have four or six sewing machines down there. Cool. So if you need to sew, that's it. Let me tell you what's down there and I'm going to explain why we have some things. So I am going to come to sewing machines because it makes a difference here. Uh, one, of the, one of the things about a makerspace is you have to have tools and I, I won't say toys, I'll say devices, but tools, but they're toys too, but yeah, whatever it is. The idea is that it is a place to come and learn through play, creative play. For example, one of the things that we uh, acquired for the makerspace to use, and it was, uh, and I, I should add that the makerspace, though I'm from the Science Math Education Institute, is a, is a, was a joint effort, is a joint effort of the library and the Science Math Education Institute. So there, we're hosting it here, a lot of the, some of the equipment has been acquired through library acquisition, some of it's, uh, a lot of it's been acquired through SMEI, and uh, we've invested things in it. But one of the things we've invested in are these now robots. Now, now robots, uh, the reason we got these is one, they're really cool, okay? And they're cool because they track people in. Because one of the things that we know as a country or that we need are people who can write code. People who can develop the next program and software. And one of the missing uh, groups, this is at least my motivation part of it. I had a couple motivations why I wanted to get these, is that one of the missing groups that are missing are women in coding in particular. There's been some national efforts to do it. Robots that are particularly human form will tend to attract because it's no longer just a guy thing. Uh, if you look at some of our other things, they pretty much look like big machines that guys would have built in their garage. Some people still do build things like that. I know Barry does, you know, all the time still. Uh, but a robot like this is pretty cool. Plus, it's that's one thing, is it's to attract people in. Uh, give you an idea of this, next week we have some students coming from St. John's Military Academy. They heard we had the robot, and they decided they're going to come visit here. So we've set them up to come down, and yeah, you guys can play and program the robot, but in the process we're going to let you visit our science departments because we really want to recruit you. So it's also a recruitment space. I, I always like to play the long game where I look at this as a long-term recruitment. Now, where will this be used at? Uh, I think the library is talking about using this as a, a, to get kids interested about using library resources. It's kind of cool. We have um, uh, Diana Plunkett and uh, Carol Murray at USD 40, Diana Plunkett on campus, Carol Murray at USD 49 are looking to use these to do some uh, research work or do some work with autistic children because there's been some research that's tied to it. So it's there. It's a tool, it's engaging, and it has multiple uses that we have there. We have 3D printers down there, and uh, we actually have, let's see, by last count, three, four, five, five 3D printers downstairs. Um, there are other 3D printers on campus, but most of those are tied to academic programs, which is great, and they should be. But what about the rest of the, the community that wants to say, hey, I want to make something, I, I, I want to replace this, or I've got an idea of something, I want to make a widget. For example, last year we had, uh, it's a little frightening, but last uh, year ago Halloween, we had some of my students, they were students who were going to do part of the Halloween shows, and they wanted to use a dissection kit with scalpels and things, and I said, oh, no, you don't use a dissection kit for a Halloween program. I said, well, can we just print it? Well, yeah, you can print it, of course. And so they printed out scalpels. Not, they don't cut. Okay. They couldn't cut. <laughs> they printed out the scalpels and all that because they said, we want to do something different. And these are some of the projects that we have across there that they've done. And uh, it's, it's kind of fun, but this has also turned into a, a project where we had a summer program that we did for some area youth that we used the makerspace and they came in, they learned some about 3D printing. And we have had some of our uh, grad student, for example, was using, um, and I'll go ahead and look at this, using the scanner, which I'll show you in a bit, to scan fossil, uh, uh, fossil bones, bird bones, 
and then trying to 3D print the bird bones so that she could do some studies with it. So it has an academic use, it has a way to engage the community, and it has a lot of creativity. There's also uh, Gordon Carlson students last year made use of this space to do some things, but since then they've gone on to get their own 3D printer. So this is a place to come and say, hey, I'll try it, see what I can do, and maybe we can do something. Uh, this summer we added one addition. The, uh, the big printer we added is we had an opportunity, and, and I will say the maker space, when you go down there, some of the parts are piece of, it's pieced and parted together from extra things, uh, Leslie will shut her ears, leftover money from grants, she didn't hear that, by the fact that I double purchased when I can, you didn't hear that. Uh, it's, it's stocked with parts, are we okay to go on? You didn't hear that. And I do have a budget to run through you, so uh, don't, don't look too closely. Uh, but the idea is that we do stock this up creatively because the university as a whole, we, it's not a, an invested space. The library is paying from some student labor, science and math education institute is, but the parts and pieces are kind of bought off and on, and so we put it together. So the reason I bring this up, the Stratus 3D printer, which is about a $20,000 printer, well, we got it on a discount rate and a garage sale, kind of, from uh, the Institute of Applied Technology because they got a brand new one. They said, we're going we're gonna to sell this off campus unless you can make a good deal to us. And I said, I'll make you a deal. And we walked it over there, and we've got a very high-grade printer in addition to the MakerBot printers. And this one, I know they've been doing some work. Uh, uh, one of the students here was helping out a person in the community that needed uh, models printed for uh, his... Uh, for, for actually printing some thing, models for train models. That he was building a model up, we needed some things printed out. And we can design those. The students here can direct people how to do it. The software's down there. A lot of the software is free, because uh, a lot of things about the maker world are open source, and coming down here and printing out models. And we do, you know, for the maker space, I like to say we do everything free, but there's a cost recovery because the plastic filament that's 3D printing is there. I invite you to come down to the makerspace and see what has been printed and maybe design your own thing. And if you want to print something, you can go to what's called uh, Thingiverse. It's on the web and they have all sorts of files where other makers have designed things and they put them up there. And that's part of the maker mentality. It's like you may not have the thing you want, but maybe somebody else did and that's Thingiverse that comes up. Well, the other thing about the makerspace, let me kind of interrupt our, what we have, but we have, we use this space. It's not just a hole in the basement in the ground that floods. And those that work in the library know, hey, I'm not kidding. It floods the new electrical system for the library. So that's kind of an interesting problem. But you know, we, we, we work around these issues. It's okay. Uh, these are some of the things that have been happening to makerspace. So we're the last, and again, I say only 16 months that we've been in operation. Uh, an after-school program with FHA pre-service teachers, those who work in the library may have noticed that each week Sarah Rhodes has been bringing kids in and pumping them down to the makerspace where they're doing STEM activities. And it's led by our pre-service teachers who are then doing service learning for the community, but we're getting kids thinking STEM, you know, which we don't do enough in the schools, and this is a great way to do it. Uh, during the summer, we had multiple camps down there. We did an, an engineering type camp where the kids were do, getting a little bit of printing. Uh, we had, this is a scary thought. Yeah, you, don't, you can hear this. It wasn't a grant, so it's okay. It's a scary thought, but we had first and second graders using the drill press. That's a scary thought. We won't go into that. You know, and you think about it, you know, why can't first and second graders? Okay. With, with guidance, okay. with guidance. And we have a first aid kit, so we're ready. <laughs> and I'm trained in wilderness first aid if it's needed. But the idea is that we're exposing kids, because think about it, in a day for some of us that are older, using hand tools and making things and just taking a hammer and whacking on nails, that was something we just did. You know, like last night at Science Cafe, rolling around in dirt, you know, those, those sorts of things we did as kids. How many kids today get to play with hand tools? I uh, not play, I mean, use hand tools constructively <laughs> other than hammers to take out brothers. That was my thing, but that was, you know, as a kid. But anyway, with that, the idea is that they get exposed to it with control, with somebody to do it. Uh, girls camp, we did a whole camp, and here's your answer. Why do we have sewing machines? We did a camp, and it was a trial balloon. It was the first in Kansas to try that we were doing an e-textile camp. We have these little programmable, uh, they're called Audrinos, they're microprocessors, 
but basically it's where kids could learn to program very simple to do the software is free we just had to buy a little kit form and you sew those things in with snaps into your clothing so you have to sew them in and then you could have clothing that would say could sense that you were turning because it has a little gyroscopic sensor and it would flip on a turn signal could be. Uh, some of it could be, uh, you know, it, it could be something like it has a, a moisture detector underneath the arms and it says, get a drink, get a drink, you know, whatever it is. It's e textile clothing. Now, we didn't get as far as we wanted because we were, again, one of the things that we do at the Science Math Education Institute is often we're a little bit ahead of time, which when I say that, I read much to my chagrin that University of Lincoln, Nebraska just got an S grant to do an e-textile course at the college level. And I thought, man, we're doing it. I'm, I'm usually about a year ahead. I just don't write as much as I should. But anyway, I thought I was kind of disappointed. So we were ahead of University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Just so you know, we're cutting edge and we're doing it with girls here at the camp. They didn't make monsters that would light up, so that was good. But they sewed it. They used the sewing machines. And the sewing machines are down there for anybody used. Uh, robotics training camp, we uh, did that down there. Super STEM experience with Washington Elementary. Uh, one of the things that we did there is that we uh, worked with Washington Elementary School. They said, we'd like a science program, but we can't have, we don't have any money. So the kids that are working the makerspace every Friday, they had them in for about an hour and a half to do a science project. They built trebuchets to launch things, they did egg drops off the roof, they built stomp rockets, and they did all sorts of cool stuff. And they did some 3D printing and all the rest. And we did that for free down there for these kids that are lower SES and didn't have anything but they wanted a STEM program. Now I'm hoping that that will continue this summer because I have a, a donor that's helped support us in the past and she's going to let me know in January if she's going to pay for us to continue this all summer for the whole community of anybody that's that way. And I think that's great. High altitude balloon program, that's actually what got this started. Uh, and I say it got it started because my balloon guys were tinkerers and they were from all over the place and they needed a place to begin to just have tools and things to play around. And that was kind of the motivation that got, got this going anyway. Home School Association presentations, we just did that this week. Uh, 3D print competitions, which is a brand new activity. So this is really open up to anybody. I'll pass these around. Uh, they, this, you're the first to hear about this. You could win a $40 gift certificate to TK's Barbecue as a grand prize. Now you're interested. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I'm sure that's the one that buys the super rib size, which is enough to feed a family of six. But you know, I've watched college students eat it in one sitting, so it's a little scary uh, that may fit there. But this is to design an ornament and print it out in 3D. Print out, so that means you can't go to Thingiverse and grab something, but you can look at it and print something out with the 3D printers and it has to the box and then the makerspace staff will judge it. And that's the grand prize, we'll have some secondary and tertiary prizes there, probably involving chocolate for those that, oh. <laughs> that way it's open to everybody. But this is kind of an interesting thing. Like I said, that's brand new, share that out, post it up, we'll get the word out. Uh, community maker parties, we've done what we call Super STEM Saturdays Community Outreach where we've just opened up and done projects for kids in the community. And I think our last one, we were probably near 100 people where parent and child were coming in. And it's very interesting to watch uh, fathers who were mechanics. This is really kind of surprising to me. Guy that's an auto mechanic and was sitting there with his son doing soldering and he was going, you know, I don't have to do this that much in my job because we just replace components. And you can see him sweating watching his son about to burn his finger off, you know, the rest of that. But the idea is soldering is a basic skill that people have lost. And we had kids where we had kids making, maybe not promoting um, good moral judgments. We are making electronic dye, so, you know, go and gamble, you know, whatever. But they're electronic dye that we were making up, that the kids were soldering it step by step with a parent there. And again, people that were, even though they're in the technical world, there's lost skills because we've moved to too many components. So it's not, not a bad thing, but there's skills that maybe are worth bringing back because that's where the next makers come. And I know one father whose son has been to just about everything we've done, and he was here this last week, and he was about in tears. He said, you mean we're done this week? I don't get to come back. And, and he it was a summer, he had torn apart all the solar lights in the yard, and his father said, I just don't want to do it anymore. And he was building things left and right. He made a robot, but he added all his own lights that lit up and you know this is a but a place like this 
is where kids like that, which are going to be the next generation that we need to do. And all kids can do it. In terms of what our actual impact is, uh, by our estimations, uh, we've had over 800 K through 12 in the last 16 months come through. So one of our smaller programs, we, we, we do more with our observatory, which is about 6,000 a year. But uh, 800 kids through is a pretty good number. And that's 16 months, considering the first few months that we were open, we were just trying to move tables out of the way. And things. So it's really quite a bit. And I think this is probably for us at the university, is that these programs don't operate with a faculty or a paid staff member. Um, I volunteer my time. Uh, nominally, I'm the director over the operations, which means somebody gets burned, I'm going to hear about it. But I volunteer my time for this. And the students we pay get paid minimum wage, not much, and they volunteer. But we've had uh, over 100 FHU students have made use or help with the volunteering. So this is not just a community thing for kids. It also involves our students. And the programs that happen are done by our students. And I think that's really key, is that this is service learning at its finest, because it's not just doing something, it's giving people the power to move on to do their own thing. And I think that's very good. Uh, some other things down there, though, if you want to come around and play. Foot remote control robot. Some of the people just like to get there and have it drag them around the hot room. I, I don't know. Everybody has their own kink, and this is theirs. Uh, we have robot kits that are down there. This is interesting is that uh, Hayes High School is going to be entering a KU engineering competition. And if anybody's paid attention, Hayes High School has ample money. Uh, not true. Uh, but they needed to borrow a robot kit. So one of their kids contacted me and they checked out one of our kits to use through their competition time. And they'll get it back just in time when we'll probably have about 20 or 30 Boy Scouts down here learning how to do a robotics merit badge. And in the meantime, anybody can go down there and just, if you ever wanted to play with the Lego Mindstorms kit or a Lego robot, come on down. They're down there to do that. Uh, hydrogen fuel cell cars, we have, again, this is, Leslie doesn't hear this, remainders or residuals from grants that end up here. You just, you're learning things you're not supposed to, so we'll go on. Uh, sewing machines, and uh, yeah, he, I will say this is Earl Watkins. He works down there, and he did say, uh, even though he can fix some of the other technical things, sewing machines are a little bit beyond his skill. He said, I can't get it to get this stitch, so it's kind of cool. Uh, but they've been trying to sew things up as they go through here, and I know they've had to sew some things for um, high altitude ballooning. And we had the girl that was in there earlier, she was, uh, the video that we did, she was just incidentally down there because she was making a cake. And it's like, yeah, great, we'll use it in the video. So fantastic that comes up with that. Uh, but this is because if you make space, we say make, make means make anything, anything that we want to make down here. Now, we don't have power saws or radial arm saws. There is a limit to what we'll do. Soldering irons is about as far we go. Drill press is about it. Uh, we're not going to go any bigger because the space isn't designed for that. We're more in the higher tech end, but, um, uh, but we do have things here and we can do stuff with it. Uh, 3D scanner, which is there, which is very cool and has been used with uh, Sternberg. Again, a case of our students, a graduate student, wanted to use it over the summer. We had no programs aligned with it, and she borrowed it to go work with the Smithsonian because they didn't have anything this good. <laughs> As I said, we are out there, Fort Hayes. This is a great space. We have wonderful things and wonderful opportunities. And uh, I guess this is one of the things that's around the library, so for those that have those old LPs and want to digitize them, Come on down to the makerspace and uh, you can set it up and go with it. And the other is kind of like a little motor with that. So um, well, let me go ahead and just transition there. Um, I guess one of the things about this is, is what about a makerspace and where should we go with this? And these are some quotes from uh, some other places that have it. But one of the things we say is that uh, is that they do. It's the ultimate workshop. It's a perfect educational space. I think that's a good thing for people who learn best by doing. And that's a lot of us. Um, you know, you can read about the robots, you can read about the things, but where are you gonna go get to play with them? Where are you gonna get to try this? I mean, you see the now robot, and you watch them playing soccer, and they have an annual soccer competition, but where are you gonna get to go and play with one? We're very fortunate that we have these things that you can do it, or you just wanna learn a bit about soldering. Whatever it is, the tools are there. Um, there is, this, as I mentioned here, a highly collaborative environment 
because of the way maker spaces are done, it's not a, you don't come in for a course, you don't come in for a curriculum. You come and say, hey, I want to try something out. Can you tell me what to do? And I think where the, the power of the library plays within this is that much of what is needed to do and build things and collaboration is through open educational resources. Uh, I mean, the resources here at the library where it connects up is a great place to not only find out how to do, but to do. I mean, go back to the older days, you may know people, they go to the library, they read up about things, and they go out and do it. Well, these days it's go online, do it, but now we have the tools for people to do it. Before it was a lot of books, and you go out and everybody had the tools. Now it's maybe online, and now we have the tools here to do it. So it fits within the, being a makerspace within the library, which is where many makerspaces across the country are, are a, a natural evolution. And uh, surprisingly, I was reading a paper, Vermilion, Ohio, which nobody knows where it is, where my, my aunt lives, and it's a little lakeside town, not very big, but they put in a makerspace, and the town is probably no more than about 15,000. They have one there for the whole community, and Sandusky Library, which is just about 30, about 35 miles down the road, um, is that also has put in a makerspace in their library. So these are cropping up everywhere because it's a way to do it, and schools are doing it in other places. But it's this highly collaborative piece. People come together and share ideas, and I see that happen a lot down there. Um, spaces, it says, are open, and this, in fact, this space is open to anybody. Faculty, staff, community, school groups, um, the home school association is a home school group that came in and wanted to have access to do squishy circuits. And I mentioned squishy circuits because they're kind of cool. It's actually Play-Doh that you put enough salt in that it's conductive, and you can give it to little kids, which is probably safe doing the drills, I gotta admit. It may not have been my best choice that day, but you take Play-Doh and you roll it out and you hook up some batteries to it, and light bulbs and wires, and you can put the Play-Doh and you can make a whole circuit, whatever you want to do. Very safe, kids aren't going to get burned, and if they do, the Play-Doh will extinguish the fire, so it works out well. Uh, it works out very well. Uh, so that's part of what we have. There's some other comments here. Everybody has control of their own learning. You come in and learn what you need. Call it just-in-time learning uh, if you want, but it's a great place to be. And uh, the hands-on use, students can come down and use it. But now let me finish up with a few thoughts. Where should, um, oh, I guess this other piece, you can read this if you, uh, as you want. It's a competitive advantage, I guess it's the one thing, is that this does give us a, a generation of people that we are great at writing software and programs, but you know, in the end, people still like things. Things that work, things that do, things that solve problems. Software is one way, hardware is another, this is a place to do it. And um, it's a place to learn new knowledge and I guess, I guess uh, interplay and innovation. And that's where I want to take about where should we go with this maker space we have here. First off, if you've been down in the basement to see it, if you haven't, I invite you to go down there, you'll probably say, well, one, it's a man cave, okay? That has to do with the fact that we have guys who've done it, but we, we're working on that. I tried to hire my daughter in there to help last summer, but oh well, I don't know. Anyway, she's an English major, so i go with that. Never mind. Those that know me know I talk about English. Never mind. Forget it, we'll stop. I'll get myself in trouble. But the main thing is we are out of space. We have more equipment, more tools, and that's a problem. Um, we do have flooding when it rains. That presents a problem. So maybe that'll be a makerspace solution to build a sump pump and you know, dump stuff up. Uh, uh, one of the things that do it is we'd like to get more usage because it's a great place. It's great opportunities, but only if you grab it which is why we've tried to get more student engagement by doing things, but we need more walk through traffic. And, and really a lot of this is like, hey, what's going on? I wanna go see it. And so this is kind of where uh, examples, and some of you may have looked at academic maker spaces. This is, uh, I think, uh, in the University of Nevada, uh, Reno, I think, or something like that. This is their maker space, where they've made an academic maker space kind of in their library space, they've taken some room, and yes, they are writing on the walls. But they're whiteboard painted walls. So they have a coating that you can erase the walls, you can do it. And you can see students having fun and coming about it. Table set up where people can come together and work. Um, things around, and they mentions here, in their makerspace, you have kids like Lego Mindstorms. Yep, we got that. Spark Fun, Arduinos, we got those. We do have some, uh, um, um, uh, we have a quadcopter down there that we stopped flying in the room. It's a little too dangerous. 
Hmm. You don't want to fly a quadcopter in a confined space, really, if you don't. But anyway, we have and button maker and some other things. We actually have not a button maker, we have an Agobot. So if you win Christmas or, ho or Christmas or any time, uh, any holiday season, Hanukkah, Christmas, Easter, whatever you want to do, you can take eggs and we've got a little printer that will draw pictures on the egg. Ooh, maybe a fabric jig. No, that's inside the egg. Forget that. But anyway, you can make really cool eggs. We have printed some stuff on light bulbs and golf balls too. If you want to make personalized golf balls, you could design it. Your own logo. Uh, anyway, students can do this, and we have kits like this sitting down there to be used right now. Like I said, nobody's really that far ahead of us, but they do some things. In other words, places that are using them, chemistry professors come down and will print out 3D molecules. Now, we haven't had many faculty take advantage, but we certainly could. I guess applied math, why does the leaning power piece of stand up? So maybe you could do that. We could print those, and we do have some things printed. Our parts <coughs> that you need, uh, and service project networking, of course, we do a lot of these things. Um, I guess we want to print skulls, that's kind of cool, I don't know, maybe that's your bin and you want to do it. And of course the one thing is about it, this one does a, a lot of makerspaces have 3D printing, we do as well, and we have, we have this box too. We don't call it the box of disappointment, but if you look, you'll find a lot of what look like very odd plastic parts, because we have a lot of buildings. <coughs> but of course that's the nature of being a maker. You are going to have failures and you go on and you learn from that and believe me we have learned a lot we learned that printing meteors is probably not the best thing to do for a printer that that was our little mistake and don't leave it alone that was, so anyway and we did print meteors uh, can you recycle that no but you might come up to creative use I want that would be a maker thing to do Mary so <laughs> Like that. But we printed me we printed meteors down there. It's really kind of fun uh, as we did it. And asteroids. And of course, 3D printing is a big deal down there. But we're much more than 3D printing. We're computers. We're robots. We're basic tools uh, that you can't get to do it. So my dream, if if we could move it, is if if with this is continuing in Forsyth Library, is that it does need to move to a more central location, you know, some place that isn't in the water well. That, that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, I really have to say that. Uh, and if we put it someplace that's more centralized, what I would picture is glass walls. No hard walls because what makes a makerspace interesting is coming in and doing. And if I have a glass wall, I can say, oh, they're flying that thing around again. That's cool. Or when they see our, I have three students that may be down there to build rockets in. Well, as one of them commented to one of the other students, said, you know, this rocket's bigger than you. And I said, good, we'll strap her to it and we'll fly her. <laughs> we had to worry about the translation. She was Chinese. I said, I'm kidding. We're not going to fly in the rocket. Uh, but but we, now they may be building rockets down there. They're huge. Or maybe they're going to be putting together trebuchet. I don't know. I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know what will get built. A more spacious room. And if you can't go down there, you see it's a little crowded, but that's what happened but an opening environment for future projects and classes. So this is what I envision. I mean, I think Fort Hayes is an early leader in the makerspace movement in Kansas, but we can be oh so much more if we choose to be, and it brings people in, and it makes use of a library in a way. A library is a place of learning. It is a place of learning, a place for people to learn on their own. I mean, that's the greatest thing. It's why Carnegie, you know, um, you know, the others invested in the library movement uh, was because we needed places for people to go learn, to be self, uh, to grow by themselves, and that's it. People that we have working this year down there, uh, these are the guys. Um, two of them are CAM students. So Harry, who's uh, uh, Harry and Patrick, uh, Harry Holly, and that's it. And then Earl and Cole, who have actually been involved in this project from the beginning, and uh, I think they're on their on their way down because they're moving on in life. And that's the thing about the university makerspace is that we get the kids who can do the skills, but we're always looking for new ones. So if you know of people that want to do this, students that are interested in working here, send them our way because we're looking to continually replace. Like I said, I always say that you know, the students that I've worked with over the years, I get them just to where I want them and they go and leave me. But that's our role is to train them and send them out to the world and we're ready to get some new ones in to do that. Uh, there are some hours here, and I do have a sheet, and you, you can uh, fold it up in a paper airplane. What else did you do with the makerspace? This is what the guys came up with. But you can see the hours. 
Uh, we are a little limited in the time, but that has to do with, uh, again, we're kind of, we kind of live on the edge. It's not a, uh, a centralized program at the university. I'd like to see it move up to such, but it's a good program, and we manage with, manage with the resources we have. And so I invite you to come down and try it out, and credits to the people who helped put this together for me. Um, Samantha Rolliter, who did pictures, and Earl Cole, Harry Patrick, who worked Makerspace, and Carrie Rolliter, who actually put this together. So at this point, then, I'll take any questions you have. Could you write on the glass walls? Um, we actually were writing on the glass walls that are downstairs, uh, and until the electricians told us, don't do that anymore. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. I don't and know. The great detective show. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. There was a, for a while. You know, if, if you go down there, you can see where the electronic, the elect, the elect central electrical system is missing. We did have um, some of the physics students who would come down there. Well, actually, camps kids coming down doing the homework. We're indeed writing all the problems in the glass walls, and they get to both sides and look at the equation. So yeah, we can, we can do that. But what we do have for the students that use, we have these uh, tear-off plastic sheets that stick to the wall, and we use those as whiteboards on the wall. Even though we haven't painted the walls to do it, we've got a way, again, to do it. Nobody has anything on us. We're ready, we're at a place I think we can grow much more and be, uh, be of greater use to all our students on campus and the community as a whole. So, but you can come down, you want to come down, I'll let you write the glass walls. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome to. And run the sewing machine. All right, okay. Actually, can we need we someone down? who's willing to come in and teach you how to can get to it. we go down today and look um, at it? Sure. I've got the key. I guess we start that. Yeah, we'll go down right after this. I think I have my key with me. Okay. Yeah, there. What's the cost of the plastic material? What's the size limitation of the objects you can make? And what's the time frame for square? Well, the, the, the cost printing. material, I'd have to look because we have two different printers and um, We've charged by the gram on that, and I think the uh, the higher grade printer, which does far better prints and a larger scale. I think our scale is about that big for the larger one. Um, I think it's like 85 cents a gram or something like that. And the others are uh, smaller prints, which are only going to get to be about that big, and they're about um, I think they're running about 25 cents a gram. Now time frame. Depending on the complexity of the print and the size of the print, um, some prints we've done take 30 hours. Uh, some prints will take an hour, um, but depending on again, so the complexity it, it, it varies. Um, it can be we often will start projects that will run overnight uh, that come up. Some things are simpler, but an hour, but usually not any less than uh, an hour. That. And I don't have my keys for down there. Does somebody here have keys for? I don't think it is. No. Did Tom have one? Maybe Steve. Steve. The maker space. Yeah. Mason's still at the desk. Somebody's got to have keys here. Yeah. <laughs> Steve <laughs> probably has it. Is Steve here? Yeah, he's yeah, here. Yeah. We can find our custodian. We can, you know, yeah. Why don't you find a custodian? I'll take a few more questions, and then uh, for some reason, I guess my whole life is. I think I forgot him at home. So you mentioned the Thingiverse. Is that a uh, Creative Commons type of thing? Or yes, it is. Okay. It's very much Creative Commons. And um, th what's happened is a lot of people design things and just pop them up there. So if you're looking for it, particularly, some people like to uh, get old-timey toys, and they'll they'll use a CAD program or um, uh, some of the free uh, CAD-type software in, uh, that's available from Google, and they'll make the toys and they'll put the toy vials up there and you'll print out the parts that you may put together. So if you look on the thing of I think Leslie, you look and there's yeah. some cool stuff there. Um, I know this summer when we did it, the Pokemon files were really popular with the kids. We printed a lot of different things from that adventure time. So you print you look for it, you'll find a lot of things. And I will say this book, Making Makers, Kids Tools Future Invention, is kind of a an interesting piece. Some other questions you have while they're looking for somebody to open the doors down there. And I, for some reason, I left my keys at home. Did you find the ornament competition? Yeah. How, how do you make the design? Well, um, well, first, I have to talk to the Makerspace guys. That's kind of <laughs> where we do. Uh, there's some uh, CAD software, computer-aided drawing software that's free. Google has Google SketchUp. 
and if you download Google SketchUp and you just pen it with your mouse, you'll draw out where you think things will fit and draw it up. And then what that file then can be taken and uh, downloaded and printed on the printer. So that's really where it comes at. Uh, and it's surprising what you can do. Does anybody have kids who are into Minecraft? Only me, I have middle school kids. Minecraft, if you talk to middle schoolers, they say, well, yeah, I play Minecraft. It's well, oh, and a, a, a world where they build block by block, they build worlds. And you can actually take part of the world and drop it down and print it out. And that's kind of exciting. I can print my world, which is kind of weird, so kind of important. Okay, so I don't know if that helped that. Try Google Sketchup. The other thing is, head down to the maker space. Yeah. Part of this is to get people down to the maker space. Well, I, I want to have some idea of what I'm doing when I get there. <laughs> well, but you know, that's, that's part of it. You come down and say, can you show me where I start? And they can help. That's part of their job is to try to do it. Now. Which is really something to, you know, to have people who have the skills to do it. Somebody get, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, yeah other questions then. Barry? Yeah. What's the strength of the material as far as using it in an actual application? Mm, let's see. The maker bots are not as good. Depend, I get what type of application you're talking well, about. Let's say you make a specialized nut bolt. Could you use it in? No, not, not really. Not really. Okay. Um, I mean, they don't have the tensile strength of metals. And part of it now, ours don't. Ours don't. Are there 3D printers that have stronger strength? Yeah, I think IETs have some things that could serve in that role. Isn't that what they're doing in space? Having this. Sp well, you, you're right. Uh, on the ISS, they did take up a 3D printer um, to, to, to use to up there. To make their own tools, <clears throat> isn't that yeah. it? Yeah, it is to make their own tools. I, I, we can make uh, wrenches and things like that. Um, I'm not sure what the, uh, the actual breakdown strength is and all that, but you know it. It is a plastic, it will break down, but there are different types of printers that can do a better job. Part of what these were for what, at one point was to do rapid prototyping. In fact, the first 3D printer we got on campus was over at the uh, IAT, and they were doing it and printing out things for A1 uh, plank. They would print out um, cornices that could be used to more rapidly set up scaffolds. So they print out the plastic one, they tried out enough. And then they sent it off to somebody to do the metal work. So that's kind of nice. Are there other, other materials that other printers use other than the plastic? Yeah, there are some uh, biological printers that will print cells. We don't, we're not going there. Uh, <laughs> uh, some will take a more material, will actually do more. That's more of a laser cutter, but they can, they'll rode away. The difference with this printer and some of those is that we build up with plastic filaments by melting filament down. The others, they do an abraded process where they'll actually um, cut away pieces. So you can cut a, you can do a metal piece, but you're probably be cutting away. But before you do that, why not print out plastic, make sure it's what you want, and then swap the file over. Uh, yeah. Do you have the laser cutter? We do not down there. I thought about it, and I was looking at it, but I decided the price wasn't good. Not so sure. Not so sure I want to put that down there. <laughs> now, there is a laser cutter on campus, though. It's over an IAT, but you got to talk with them about that. That's kind of different. But they'll, I think they can be contacted for paid projects or things like that. But I don't want to speak for them. Yeah, I don't want to speak anymore for them. I don't get myself in trouble. Okay, other questions? If not, we can head downstairs. Uh, and I got 